I think I'm recording. I don't have uh, a warm fuzzy telling me so. You, you should maybe stop the screen share just to be sure. Yeah, you're right. Oh, it, no, it says it's recording. It's up. It does? Okay. Yeah. We're recording. All, All right. right. Cool. All cool. Right. Oh, look. Oh, no, you know what? There's a little, ah, see, there's a tiny, do you see where my arrow is? Yes. Tiny little icon there. Yeah. 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 Look, you can learn everything about me from my bookmark <laughs> toolbar. <laughs> All righty then. Talk us in, Terry. <laughs> All right. Welcome to another episode of Drop Third Strike with myself, Terry Gant in Chicago, Illinois, and my podcast partner, Beth Davy Stavka in Denver, Colorado. Um, you who may have uh, just been on this call for about the last three minutes have <laughs> been witness to our difficulties of screen share and tiny type and <laughs> where the hell is the thingy, <laughs> which I'm sure... It has happened to all of you if you've ever had to do Zoom. We've been doing Zoom for the last eight, nine months now. This is something we've all had to go through. We're still going through it. That's right. In baseball news, now that we, <laughs> we're, we're out of season, right? Mm -hmm. We have some really kind of odd things, right? Like what I, I was saying at some point that it's uh, the, big, the big challenge this offseason is the baseball owners lost so much money yet some baseball players are really kind of do some money. So you're about to have a really interesting off season of guys who thought they were going to get paid or not guys who end up getting paid are going to get paid. Maybe something they didn't think they were going to get paid and owners are still trying to save themselves from themselves. And I think the thing that's up on our screen right now is kind of indicative of what is required sometimes to stay in the game as you get older, you know, like yeah. Robinson Cano getting popped for PEDs at, <laughs> But how old is Robinson Cano? How He's old like, is he? Um, let me see. Where do they put that in? He is. Don't they put this in here? He's age 38. Yeah, it's by, by his birthday. Oh, okay. By October his birthday. 22nd. He's 38 years old. So he's nearly 40 years old. He's still been, and he's from the Dominican Republic. So he might actually be like 45, right? That's right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and this is what I always feel like is the thing with performance enhancing drugs in baseball. It's that. People are using these not because, oh man, I really want to make sure I hit 75 home runs. People are using these because they just want to stay in the game. Like they want to like be able to work out, be able to recover, right? Be able to function. You know, this is a lot of years. This dude has been in the league for a long time, right? So like for, for what people think performance enhancing drugs do for you, the Robinson Cano's stat line is 54 hits, 10 home runs. He hit 316. Scored 23 runs, got himself an RBI 30 times, stole no bases, an OPS plus of what is that? Is that like 144? Like, you know that what I mean? Like 2020, yeah. In 2020, he those aren't stellar numbers, right? right. He and he's he's basically DHing, right? So like half of DHing really is all about just a job for a guy that doesn't want to not have a job in baseball, as opposed to like, you know, a guy who's playing left field playing third base or playing right field, playing first base, playing, playing catcher, playing first base. You know, you can move a guy around when he's when he's got like some mobility and and, and, and position versatility. DHing, a lot of times DHing is you're we don't need that glove in the field. That's not really a glove anymore. Or mm -hmm. you're a great guy to have around. We like having you around or that salary is guaranteed. We got to have a position for you. We're going to be paying you something. If we're going to paying you for something, you got to do something. So right. Robinson can know DHing. He's listed as second baseman, but really that dude's a DH, right? Yeah. So, and with the universal DH, Robinson Cano has a job right. next year, right? Like that, if, if we're keeping that, Robinson Cano needs that job. So performance, performance enhancing drugs are absolutely a thing that you're going to see because it's going to be people using them for the reasons you would expect them to be used, not like just to be able to hit 30 home runs. Even in a full season, Robinson Cano wouldn't hit 30 home runs. Right. You know, second half of the season, everybody's power numbers dip. So even if he had 15 home runs in the beginning of the season, he's not going to hit another 20. Right. You know what I mean? It's not happening. That's, right. that, the numbers don't really bear that out. So I, I would say poor Robinson Cano. It's almost hilarious that this dude had to do the performance and answer dress, but I understand why. Uh-huh. What do you, how do you feel about it? I uh, I have two questions for you. Um, okay. One of the because uh, I'll I'll say them more open ended one for a second. And the first one is um, I suspect that you know a lot about Robinson Cano and his career because he left the Yankees for the Mariners. Did he? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it 
which case I thought it would be nice uh, for you to comment on Robinson Cano from that perspective. As I a- loved Robinson Cano <laughs> when he went to the Mariners. I thought, man, the Mariners got a steal of this, this talented kid who, who hit everything, caught everything. Like, it, I guess his fielding might have been a bit like, I don't know. His, his fielding may have been a little bit underrated. People thought he was, I don't think people thought he was as good a fielder as he actually was. But for a second baseman who were power hitters, they're just for when he came to the Mariners, that wasn't very common in the league, right? Like second baseman were defensive guys. You know, they were they were dudes who were out there not for their, their stroke. They were out there for their glove. And Robinson Cano had more bat than glove, right? right. And I remember him being a Yankee and just being like, this kid is hitting everything. And then getting to the Mariners, and it's like, hot damn, the Mariners got Robinson Cano. I was thrilled. Yeah. I was so happy that you could build around that guy. The problem was with the Mariners, now you've paid him like he's an MVP, which means that's money you can't really use to bring more guys to build around mm-hmm. Robinson Cano. Yeah. So it kind of hamstrung the Mariners a little bit. They had guys, but Robinson Cano being the centerpiece there, you know, like that that just kind of meant that you're going to have some problems in terms of being able to afford the free agents because they overpaid him. Right. Right. Okay. So, uh, so how were the Mariners better with Robinson Cano? I thought they had some good years because the the that era was still like an Ichiro like era. Yeah. Like there was there were guys there who were all good, but there were just never enough pieces to make it actually work and be the best team in the in the American League. Like, but me being like a Mariners fan, I was almost yeah. blinded to it. I was so happy for his performance there. Yeah. Right? Like, I always felt every year like these guys are gonna they're gonna win the AL West. Oh, they're in last place. All right. They'll win <laughs> but, it next year. But having him there made it a lot more fun to watch them, though, didn't it? Yes, absolutely. Right? Yeah. It totally did. Yeah. It totally did. The The trouble is, with a, with a guy like a bat like Robert Sucano, you kind of want a smaller ballpark, right? The Mariners were playing in a park that I think, if I recall correctly, was kind of like, a, it's, it's, a, it's a decent-sized park. You want to make sure that that power is like, you know, you, you want something like what San Francisco has, right? as opposed to something like what the Padres have, you know, you don't want to, you don't need a pitcher's park with guys like Robinson Cano. You need him to be able to take advantage of your small ballpark. And I think that they, it wasn't really a ballpark that really like worked. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But still it was like, a, it was like kind of watching the Marlins this year uh, yes. and even seeing them get to the playoffs. It's like, yeah, but I don't know any of these people. Yes. And when they're all people that are kind of anonymous to you, it doesn't, because I used to wonder about that. I used to wonder, well, I mean, it's the game that I love. So, and the players just come and go all the time anyway, you know, yes. um, <laughs> I don't necessarily, if somebody retires this year, I may not notice them missing when the new season starts. And so I always thought the game was beyond the players, but it actually isn't. And that's something I learned this year with the Marlins because I, I really wanted to root for them. They, sh- they were so unlikely they shouldn't have been in the playoffs. And so uh, that should have been exciting. But and so I was like, who are these people? And it was strange. It was just this. I had no way to get in and yeah. root for them. A person or persons really makes a difference. Right. So yeah, Robinson Cano got to the Mariners and he hit uh, looks like he had 14 home runs, 21 home runs, 39 home runs. 23 home runs, like, and 10 home runs. So, like, at that 39 home runs, you got a guy hitting 39 bombs, and it's like, that's got to be incredible. Yeah, but, like, you didn't have three guys hitting 39 bombs, and that's kind of what they, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. That's really exciting. And he would have been, what, the second best player on the team while he was there? Probably so. Yeah, yeah. And which is even more exciting, right? Because, you know, you can always, no matter what, you can say every four or five days or what have you, um, active days, not off days, you're going to see King Felix pitch. Right. And that is must watch TV every time, you know? So that I think that made the, Mar- the Mariners into a really exciting team for a little while. Uh, I mean, and beyond that, you know, I've had the same problem with the Mariners as I've had with the Marlins. It's like, well, who are these guys? And how do I connect to them? Because I don't really know who they are. That 2016 season for yeah. Robinson Cano and his 39 home runs. Yeah. That the the best players on his team were Nelson Cruz and Kyle Seeger. Do you know what I mean? Like like that's kind of wow. That that's that's a lot of guys who have to like who are who are older than you think uh-huh. and really young at the time. 
Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I was... but like his his pitching staff involved King Felix, um, James Paxton, uh-huh. right? Who also eventually became a Yankee. Like, uh-huh. there's not a lot. Of, there's not a lot there. There's a lot right. of like, man, they sure did pay Robinson Cano, right. which kind of had them suffering a little bit. Right. Okay. So that's that. So now I'm gonna, let's leave my other question for now. Okay. So. <laughs> How do you get that kind of, you know, and this sets us up for off-season conversation. How do you get that kind of balance, right? Where you you can pay a lot for a couple of really good guys, but you can surround them with a lot of really good guys. And is that why it's so important to have some money to spend on the one hand, and but then also a good farm system on the other? And how do you manage that as a GM? To what extent do you have money to spend versus talent in your farm system? So I think it's like it, it starts at the, the beginning of it is going to be identifying a player like Robinson Cano, trading him for every asset you can get for him, right? Uh, finding the next guy that your next better best guy, trading that guy away for as much as you can get. And then you bring up all these young prospects at the same time mm-hmm. right? and you save your money. So that when all your young prospects are actually ready and they come up at the same time and now you're competing, you can afford to pay those guys. And yeah. there will be more of those guys than the two guys you were losing with. Okay. You know, like if Robinson Cano had 30 some odd home runs, Adam Lind had 30 some odd home runs, like Adam Lind, nobody's like, you know, oh man, good. We got Adam Lind. Basically what you want to do is you want to <laughs> make sure you didn't have Adam Lind, Robinson Cano and, and Nelson Cruz making the most money on your team, hitting a shit ton of homers, but not helping you win. Because right. you need everybody else to be able to play too. So right. you take some of those guys, you dump those salaries, you get as much back as you, because someone's going to win with them. It just won't be you, yep. right? And then whatever you get for them is probably what the Yankees did. When when Robinson Cano went to the Mariners, they, they probably fleeced the, the farm system to get as much as they could, right? And then the players you're seeing now coming up for the Yankees and being awesome might have been involved in that deal. Right, right. You know? And so how does that, because I, I feel, and I'm going to say feel very deliberately here, it's, a, it's an intuitive connection to what you're saying. It seems like something that most baseball fans can intuit is that it's a bad idea to spend your farm system to get a star. And does, that just seems kind of obvious. You, you spend your farm system to get a star when you're ready to win. Right. right when you're when you're one player away yes right. now you trade an asset in right. your in your farm because you, you're going to get the guy you need you're going to once you win you won right? right like you did it that's exactly right. what you were supposed to do yeah. you know but you can't trade your farm system for middle of the road guys that are just roster spot fillers yeah right you can if you're going to have a roster spot filler you're just going to sign roster spot fillers what you really need is the highest level of assets you can in your farm system uh-huh. And you need to have all these guys basically coming up one after the other so you can build an actual good team. It's going to take you a few years. And then when you're ready, like, oh, okay, we're, we're, we're one power hitting first baseman away, sign your guy. We're one ace pitcher away, sign your guy. If you're two ace pitchers away, sign both guys. But your team is set <laughs> before you get so, to that point. So why did the Mariners go after Robinson Cano when they did and in the way they did? Man, if it was Jerry Depoto, Jerry Depoto makes moves. Jerry Depoto does nothing but he, Jerry Depoto is trading three guys right now. Yeah, he can't help him. <laughs> Jerry Depoto is a fantasy baseball player. That dude. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so he's just he's just impulsive, or uh... I, I think he, I, he he's got to be. Yeah. If you, if you look at like how many moves per team, you're gonna find that Jerry Depoto and the Mariners have made five times as many moves as anybody else. Yeah. Okay. And just no matter what, that dude's making moves. Okay, so he's like too too. Uh, I'm gonna call him profligate. Um, and then maybe you say a guy like Billy Bean uh, is too conservative. Yes. Okay. Okay. So how does a profligate guy keep getting hired? Well, I think that in the case of Depoto, like he has, he must be like the nicest damn guy in the front office. Like he, he gets hired, but then he sticks around for a while. Like Jerry Depoto has not been in a place. He's, it's not like he's got a job for three years. He's fired, gets another job for three years. He gets a job. He's there for 10 years. <laughs> Right. Like he's just he's there, you know, and and if the if the ownership of the baseball team is really thinking about it like a business, well, you don't have to win the World Series to be profitable. 
right? You just be competitive. You got, you know, like baseball numbers are down across the board and only one team's going to win the World Series. So all you really have to do is make sure you're on television, right? right. At some point, be in a race, right. you know? Field a quote unquote competitive team right. that just happens to end up in last place. That sucks. Yeah. You didn't start in last place, right? Like, yeah. you think about it like that. We have, we put butts in the stands, and this is what didn't happen this year in baseball, but generally you put butts in the stands, you sell the beer, you sell the hot dogs. It's a great day out here. Your team's competitive. You got young up and coming dudes. You are not going to win the World Series, but you don't tell your fans that. Right. You right. know you're not going to win, but you yeah. ain't saying it. Yeah. Yeah. Because when, 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 you know, all, every year when you're looking at the, 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 the races, the pennant races coming up, and it's like, it's like August, and you're like, ooh, we did it this year. We were like, ooh, Minnesota's got a chance. Yeah. San Diego's got a chance. Yeah. Right? Like, the Marlins, like they had a chance, you know, like, the, but, but what was the truth of the thing was, we knew, we, we knew even then that there's no damn way in the world, the Minnesota Twins and, and, and the, the, My, the Florida Marlins or Miami Marlins or whatever, there's no way in the world they thought to themselves at the start of the season, let's go get this World Series. Right. We're going to do it right now. They thought we can make a run, right. which is profitable. You make right. a run, right? right? But like, they're not the Dodgers, right? They're not the Yankees. They didn't spin, spin, spin to get there. You know, right. some of those teams spent and lost. You know, some guys, a lot of guys, they don't want to spend. They want to. They want to not spend. They want to be competitive. They want to look competitive, right? And they get skunked at the end, and it's like, ah, we were so close. We're just on the cusp. Yeah. But the ownership is thinking, hell yeah, that makes us money. Uh -huh. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. That that makes a lot of sense. You don't necessarily have to play to win. You have to play to be competitive. You 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 want the people who are paying for tickets and coming and buying all your concessions and wearing your gear. You want those folks to think they have a chance. Major League Baseball is a lot like pro wrestling, right? <laughs> baseball fans are marks. You know, uh, uh, the baseball owners are carny hucksters who are trying to fleece you. Yeah. Right, they know damn well whether or not they've built an actual winner. They need they're convinced they're trying to convince you they've done it, but yeah. if you're really paying attention, you know damn well they have it, and you're going <laughs> along with the hucks the, the scam, you're going yeah. with it, you know it. Yeah, well, I, I just do. Do. you know, I'm trying to think about Rocky's culture here for a couple minutes because, uh, um, you know, we should wind back around to Mariner's culture just, just on this mm -hmm. point because Rocky's culture, <clears throat> I mean, there are fans who will wear Rocky shirts. And I don't think anybody goes as far as to paint their faces. I mean, this is a Broncos town, right? Yes. But there, there are Rockies fans who will show the up. Broncos are another solid example though. Yeah, but they'll have, I don't think anybody here really believes we're ever gonna win um, or even right. that we'll ever be competitive. I don't, I, you have to be pretty willfully blind to believe that. <laughs> or right. you have to just really want to be, be able to have that kind of faith and so you just generate it you know yes um, i think mostly it really is for coloradoans that is a really nice way to spend an afternoon or an evening you know yes. I mean, baseball is beautiful yeah you got a nice beer you got a dog it's a beautiful day let's just hang out it's a good time and everybody's nice to each other and we have fun and that's what baseball is in colorado they don't ever have they don't even really have to be competitive they just have to have that couple of players that everybody can connect to you know like uh mm -hmm. we know Nolan Arenado because we know his name and we know he's really really good yes right and that's we need Charlie Blackman for the same reason we know his name and we know he's really really good and do you know what I don't think I could tell you any other Rockies player right now Trevor Story uh oh yeah and he's really really good <laughs> really, really yeah. good thank you <laughs> <laughs> yep, I recognize that name. <laughs> Trevor's story is distractingly good. Yeah, he is distractingly I never, good. I never thought this was gonna he was gonna be as good as he is. And yeah. damn it, every year when I draft in fantasy baseball, by the time I remember shit, let me get Trevor's story. Some guy drafts him right before me. Like last couple of years has happened. It's like, damn it. Oh. He does everything. Have you done your draft yet? No, like um my league is probably gonna wait till the very last damn minute. We find out whenever baseball is going to happen next year before we do oh, a draft. I think our draft okay. is always like just about the eve of the season starting is what our draft always is. Okay. So let's, uh, let's think about um, Mariners culture. Um, and I know, I know you're not broadcasting from Seattle, but still it's, it's an interesting question to me. If I were a Mariners fan, I would not assume that I was, my team was ever going to win. 
you know, the same way that I do here in Denver. I don't assume that my Rockies, they're not even my Rockies. I don't ever think the Rockies are going to win. I just think it's a really nice day at the ballpark. But so, I get the sense from Mariners fans that there's a real longing. Yes. Yeah. Because the Mariners got so close in the 90s. Oh, we all, we got to the World Series in 2007. Yeah. And, and I think that, that's out. sort of like when you, when you can see <laughs> the talent, like when you can see that you've got world-class talent on your team yeah. at different points, but never at the same time, yeah. it, it does make you start to think, man, all we have to do is beat the A's. Okay. You know, like in your brain, you're not thinking, I got to beat every team in the American League. You're just, you're thinking this is the AL West. Uh -huh. How many teams are really contenders out here? Honestly, the yeah. Angels are going to finish last for us. Yeah. They're going to finish last <laughs> so we don't have to, right? right? <laughs> the the A's the A's are gonna play that Billy Ball bullshit and they're gonna like you know have a bunch of guys come up who name we barely know who are gonna play over their heads and they're not gonna be able to keep it in these dudes we can beat those guys too right yeah. right the, the the AL West is almost exclusively a bunch of guys who don't really want it but someone's gotta win the division so the Mariners every year Mariners you feel like you got a shot yeah. And you honestly do until you lose like nine straight at the end of the season and you go from literally like a half game out of first place to suddenly like, you know, 13 back of some bullshit, right? And it, this is what happens. The Mariners don't suck from the beginning of the season. They collapse at the end uh, because they're missing something. Oh, okay. You know? oh, and Jerry DePoto has made 90 moves yeah. and none of it fixed the problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, is he still there? Yeah. How long has he been there? Man, I, boy, since Moses was a teenager, I think. Oh, but like, okay. so probably only since like 2012 or some shit like that. You know but, what I mean? So Billy Bean's been with the A's. Did he actually retire? I saw I saw headlines threatening that he was thinking about it. So no, I thought he left. Okay, I, he left, I, right. I did think he left, but I could be wrong. I don't follow there a lot of There was a period of time there when it was DePoto versus Bean, wasn't it? Yeah. When yeah it was I, and, and I think it's, yeah, because the, 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 the technique is the same right yeah. like not to overpay for this feeling of production but find the hidden value in guys and then yeah. like use that to win you baseball games okay right like if I, if I look at guys on the Mariners I see there's like hidden value all over the place right like they they have a solid team Kyle Seager yeah like yeah that's my guy you know I love Kyle Seager Wait, there we go. There he is. Yeah. Look at him. He looks like a plumber. Yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> he absolutely does. Now he's only 33. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's funny in that he's like, he's, he's, it, he's been in the league almost 10 years. Uh -huh. Right. But like, there's not a lot of like Kyle Seeger being great in his first couple of years, but in the last couple of years, like this year was a down year for him. Right. With his nine home runs, you know, and like like handful of RBIs, but some of that stuff picks up when you've got like other guys on your team also contributing, like and and getting on base and doing all these different things. I think during COVID season, a lot of guys had like, you know, not so you know great, not so great seasons compared to what they'd done before. You know, if you uh, if you strip out, you know, the 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 first two the first two segments, right? Like if you strip out WAR at bats, etc. Um, and you strip out runs to stolen bases, and you just look at on base percentage, slugging, OPS, and OPS plus. Yes. I twenty twenty was pretty much how he's been. Yes. So that's steady guy. Yeah. You know, you come in on a on a shortened season with all the mayhem. And unlike and unlike Robinson Cano, who I believe wouldn't give you, you know, thirty home runs or whatever in a full season, I do believe Kyle Seager would. Oh. Right, based on Kyle Seager's past, his actual past performance and the way he plays, I actually think that guy would give you the thirty home runs. He did in twenty sixteen, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which was yeah. Robinson Cano's thirty nine home run year. Oh wow! Twenty seventeen, so he, he gave you twenty seven. You know? Yeah. Do you buy that theory that when you have a one guy playing really well, then some of the other guys play really well, and it's no coincidence? I, I buy it if there's guys getting on base. I don't buy it if like Robinson Cano can hit, you know, he can hit you 25 home runs and, and with no one on base, then you didn't beat anybody. Right. But if like, right. if there's guys playing ahead of you 
who've got like the, the skill and the game to be on base, to be putting pressure on pitchers. Like now all of a sudden it's not like, you know, it's not, it's not 10 home runs and, and 30 RBI. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's 25 home runs and 110 RBI, right? Like right. it's that kind of thing, you know? Right. Okay. So let's talk about on base percentage then. Yep. Like how, how much does that matter? Like, would you say that, would you, would you like appreciate Kyle Seeger in particular because he has an on-base percentage that's above 300 routinely? I think that's great. However, he's not, I'm not looking for Like, I'm glad that he isn't an on-base guy. Right. Like, but like, <laughs> I want Kyle Seeger hitting the ball over the fence. Okay. Okay. So now Trevor, my, my, my third baseman coming along and saying, yeah, right. If Trevor's story is on this team, uh -huh. Kyle Seeger's numbers look a lot better. Okay. Cause you Trevor know. story's on base, right? All the time. Oh, okay, yeah, and stealing, wakes up on this. right? Yeah, yep. yep, swarming pitchers with all this pressure and just yes. doing, it and doing it. Yeah, okay. So that's now are going to be our new campaign is for the Mariners to somehow get Trevor Story from the Rockies, even though that's impossible because because there's contracts and well, stuff. Sure, <laughs> but but like this is this is the this year's off season is the the owners talking about having lost. 40 billion dollars with a b right like some oh. crazy amount of money like now does this do we get guys doing salary dumps yeah right oh you, we you, must are you are you going to win the al west next year with the padres and the dodgers who are stable or coming up are you going to win the al west with the guys you got and, and if they'll say arbitration eligible eligible they're due to be paid more right mm -hmm. they're in another year of their contract are you gonna are you gonna win paying these guys more while you yourself are crying broke, right? right? Right. Or do you do you break it up and say, all right, you know what? We're not going to be whole again until 2023 anyway, uh -huh. right? Why don't we dump some salary, uh -huh. get us some draft picks, let those guys like be our, our AAA dudes. And then in 2022, 2023, 2024, we're back, yeah. right? I think some teams are going to do that, Yeah. you know, because there's, there's no, there's no way to, shell out big but like okay i was looking at um free agency moves right the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. and there were guys who like absolutely have like options you know player options to stay with their team or to walk well guys are taking their player options to stay because if they stay they get paid that 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 next big check that's due to them yeah. they're not going to walk because they're expecting ah shit maybe there's just not as many takers out there for me right oh, Teams with club options are like hey so yeah we're just You've been great. We love you. My kids love you. My wife loves you. Hey, everybody down at the at the at the church, they think you're all great for the team, but we gotta let you go. Right? Because club option, when you lost $40 billion, you don't want to pick up somebody's $25 million salary for right. one year at 0.5 above replacement player level, you know, work. Right. So is this you a know? pattern that you've seen so far, kind of kind of transpiring over the last couple when, of weeks? When free agency first started, I think I did notice it with some guys, and I laughed about it because I was like, there's guys out there who at the beginning of this year knew they were in their free agent year who thought they were going to go someplace and break and break a bank or something, or at least crack a piggy bank, and right. now they're like, it's better to just stay here right, for one more year. Yeah. And they're kind of right. It is. It is. You should fleece those owners for as much as you can. Right. You know? You should absolutely do that. It's the best thing for you because otherwise you're in a situation like George Springer still hasn't been signed, right? No. He's the best free agent available. George Springer still doesn't have an actual home and an actual job. So if George Springer doesn't have an actual home and an actual job, what's it say for everybody below George Springer? Yeah. In the list, right? Yeah. No, if it were me, I'd be, I'd be, you know, being not George Springer. If it were me and I'm not George Springer, I'm looking around and I'm saying, yep, I'm going to stay put as long as everybody else does. I'm waiting to see what people do, right? Right. And I think Springer wants to move, but everybody's yeah. waiting to see what that paycheck looks like. Right. Right. What's that contract? Whatever that, whatever he's going to set the market and whatever that is, is uh, everybody else then goes, okay, I am now going to get 20% less than that. I'm going to get 15% less than that. I'm a 30% less than that guy. But then I at least know. Yeah. But if, exactly. if you're not even giving Springer money yet, if he's got no paper, if he's not been able to secure the bag, as they say, then no one else is going to secure the bag before him. Right. You know? Right. I believe he's the best hitter. Like, there's also guys like, like, honestly, if it wasn't for the COVID kid, uh, 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 Justin Turner, if it yeah. weren't for Justin Turner's COVID stunt yeah. at the World Series, he might be, he's also a free agent. Oh, right. That's somebody I think folks would want to. Right. Because he's proven it. Right. Every damn year, Justin Turner proves it. But right. I think Justin Turner might be slightly bad 
press. Right Slightly now. bad. Slightly bad. Yeah. It might be worth it for Justin Turner to hang out with the Dodgers a little bit longer until we don't remember the images of him walking around trying to be a super spreader. Right. So, so okay. So let's talk about America for a minute. Okay. <laughs> Because, uh, uh, you know, I think that we saw from the election results that we're a pretty divided country. And I think the last time we spoke, we hadn't even had elections yet. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think we texted about that a little bit. Just, yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, the uh, the results were really dramatic illustration that this country is pretty well split. Sure. Now, I don't know. I don't, I don't think you can say, well, you know, 74 million here and 76 million there, whatever it says anything about COVID. I don't think it's a referendum on anything. I don't really, I don't, if it is, I don't know, there's mixed, there's all kinds of crazy different things going on. But if you think about it, uh, you have that kind of a split. And at the same time you have, I think right now they said, right, right now, as you and I are sitting here talking, there are 12 million people with COVID. Yeah. Um, where are we with that? Like, is there is there gonna be an overwhelming sense that Justin Turner did kind of a bad thing and and could be bad press or is there going to be oh i half and half like yeah you know i think, I think eventually the justin turner thing will die down like there's going yeah. to be a point in which we are so focused on something else come let's say january yeah right the justin turner can get recruited by any team in the country yeah and have, and have a move that's perfectly fine they'll flash his world series stuff up there because he was in the world series yeah. right and someone, Buster only will be like, and he hopefully exercises better judgment when he goes to oh, I know. Atlanta, right? Like that's gonna that's especially what Tim Kirkton's gonna say, because he's gonna be like, Oh, you shouldn't have done that. Yes, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I, I think that it won't be it won't be like one baseball guy is like, I mean, one baseball guy was kind of the COVID poster child, but so was one yeah. baseball team. Yeah, you know, or two baseball teams, or four baseball teams, or four baseball teams. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little hard to count. Get into the playoffs, and people were absolutely like, "Look at the Marlins! Isn't this incredible?" And by the way, Tim Kirkton, if you're listening, I love you. I love you. I love you, and I love your spirit. And I'm so glad you give grace to everybody. You're a little bit of an old bitty, but you're brilliant, and I love you. And I made fun of you, but you had it coming. That that right there <laughs> is how you like pour some honey over a spoonful of thumbtacks. That's not nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> You're a bit of a bitty. But it's all true, because he is a bit of a bitty, but I really do love him. <laughs> you stole that dude a bitty. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope oh he comes, I hope he comes on as a guest sometime and I can just tell him so right after. He would just laugh, is, you know. I got, I'm gonna let you know this is why we've been called into this meeting. I'm just gonna talk to you about some things. You're a bit of an old hard ass. And you might want to lighten up a little bit. However, you're a very sweet guy. Baseball can't forever be like it was in 1970, whatever. I can't. You're constantly fucking referencing. <laughs> Always referencing when you were a kid going to ball games, you got to see the shot heard around the world or whatever the hell it was you're making some rep every day you are always referencing how it used to be and how it has changed yes tim we know we know yeah. <laughs> or maybe we have no idea because we have had the the just whatever the the pliance we know to be able to change with it you know i mean <laughs> <laughs> it is a different game but i i like baseball so that's okay and that takes me actually to my other robinson cano question because oh, this okay. is a beautiful segue into it which is the changing game but you know if i remember correctly so you might have to you might have to correct me on this but if i remember correctly robinson cano was with the new york yankees right and he went into free agency and he went with jay-z as his agent right yep yeah, yeah. All right, so the impression that I got, fair or not, and I mean, I don't know if I'm being fair to the media here, but I felt like the media was telling me to believe that Robinson Cano had done something pretty heinous by doing that. Hmm. That's what I, I, I think that the, the, the impression or the implication there is, here comes Jay-Z and Jay-Z money with Rock yeah. Nation getting involved in sports kind of agenting, which yeah. is sort of like not their 
you know, not their 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 sort of bailiwick, right? Like it's not right. their zone. Stay in right. your lane. Represent rappers or make music or go get into movies or or, right. or right. passion if that's what you want to do. But what do you don't come in here fucking with our baseball shit and our sports shit because owners mm -hmm. are trying to get over and we don't need you coming around telling the players the truth. Right. 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 That that is always the thing, right? And and what Jay Z and Rock Nation, as a as a sports representation entity, were effectively doing was coming along and saying, "Hey, there are any number of agents out there that could represent you. Some yep. of them might even be good people. Yeah, but some of them are not our people. Right? right? They're right. not going to represent you to your ownership group the way we would because we don't give a fuck." Right? right, we're gonna go in there and tell these guys this is what you're worth, uh -huh. and honestly, we will take you somewhere else. Uh -huh. We're not gonna we're not gonna go in there and smoke cigars with these dudes. We're not gonna yuck it up. We're not gonna go in there and 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 play some like old old boys club kind of bullshit between the ownership and your right. representation. We're gonna represent you in a way that lets them know it's a new day around here. Let's get you paid. Yeah, and I think that the media naturally took a position of Jay Z and these guys were outsiders. Yes, right. When the truth is, all it takes is a bit of money and a couple of high profile clients, and now you're an insider. Right, it should. You know, and that's what they've done. So yeah. now they represent far more people than Robinson Cano. Right. right? And, and you, it's like dealing with, like the way you got to deal with Scott Boris. People hate dealing with Scott Boris. Yep. Right. Because Scott Boris doesn't actually care about the owner's feelings, right? He doesn't care about the fan base's feelings. He, his, right. his job is to truly represent his client. Right. And that means these negotiations are going to be hard, right? Right. But his client's going to be thrilled at the end of it, and you're going to hate this guy. Yeah, I can respect that. I totally. That's what you when, want. When the, when the owners tell me they just lost forty billion dollars, uh -huh. but they're still billionaires. Yeah. Right. You you misplaced forty billion is what you did. You didn't lose it. Right. Well, there's thirty two <laughs> teams. Go clean That's your room. Basically, a billion a team. That's, yes. You know, not pocket money, but it, but you know, it's not significant. Clean your room. You'll find that billion again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do your laundry. Yeah. Find that billion. Yeah. So with Jay Z, with Jay Z representing Robinson Cano and this media storm around it, I it struck me as being, uh, without being knowledgeable, I'm not an insider, right? It just struck me as being um, a really striking instance of how um, how baseball and I probably all sports are this kind of set apart. They're popular culture, but they're set apart. Yes. You know? And you kind of nailed it when you said, well, you know, come on, Jay-Z, you know, you don't come over here to the sports part yes. of popular culture. You just expand that into your part of popular yes, culture. Yes, stay in your lane. Yeah. 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 And, and Jay-Z, see, Jay-Z is also rich. So it's kind of like he can, he can go where you're going. You know, this company can go where you're going. It's not like they, they pulled their money together and they're like, they're totally thousand heirs, right? Like yeah. they, they're trying to get on your level. Yeah. You know, no, no, he's built an empire here. Yeah, he can do this. This is a, this is the next step. Yeah, like, he can have a kind Brooklyn of you can have a third example of that, right? Like yeah. the, the whole move, getting to Brooklyn next to Brooklyn, the yeah. New York, the New York next to Brooklyn. Like all of that is like a function of stepping into an arena and saying we belong here too, and you're gonna listen, and then people having to listen. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Okay, so how is it that Jay Z manages to to break into this new? very closed area and mark cuban can't why can't mark cuban buy a baseball team that you know what that is a very good question one i think that like so so the two different kinds of questions jay-z started a a sports representation entity right so he didn't need a team he just needed players willing to give him a shot and give him a percentage okay. yeah mark cuban needs someone to walk away and let him in right okay you know, Mark Cuban needs to find the Kaufmans of Kansas City yeah. and convince them to get the fuck out. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> right? And then let him in. Yeah. You know, like, like, or baseball needs to expand. Yeah. Let's just say the E word. Uh huh. If baseball were to expand and Texas could get a, what, a third team? Yeah. Right? Then they become like, you know, the, the Dallas. Like, I don't know, the Dallas Mustangs or whatever the shit, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. with expansion, Mark Cuban has an easier route in, but baseball isn't entirely trying to do that, given that they still haven't really recovered from the Montreal Expo situation. True. You know, baseball is kind of at, like, circling the wagons to get the money it can get. And honestly, I think that 
the way the when they expanded and created the Rockies and the Marlins, I what I really liked about that yeah. was I like watching that process of teams having to release a couple players and they go into the pool to be drafted. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. That was an f- exciting time. It was, yeah. To like to see who teams are gonna let go and not protect. And, and, and like watch these new franchises build these teams up. And what ended up happening within like X and like a sh- single digit number of years, the Marlins are in the World Series. Right. Rockies too, right? Rocky Sue, yeah. Like I think that that is is what could happen with expansion. You can grow your fan base, but baseball seems to just let everybody else take the fan base, right? You know, and run with it, and and right. they're not really like so interested in new blood ownership and and right. new markets to be in. You know, like why the hell not? W- yeah. What's the problem here? Why be so conservative? Yes, especially when there's money to be made. Why be so conservative? Why is there like there's a team in Toronto? There's yep. not a team in Montreal that, that was that turned out to become a fiasco. Right. But why is there not a team in Mexico City? Right. Why does Dallas not have a team? Right. You know, like 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 why, why does Las Vegas not have a team? Right. You know. And why like, out of the entire southern United States does only Atlanta have a team? I mean, unless you count Florida. I I mean, I know Florida's the Miami south, but I tell and you Tampa Bay. Different. Like yeah. they, they get Tampa Bay and they get they get Miami. Yeah. So they get like both halves of the state. But in all of the rest of those states, there's no Tennessee, Kentucky, right? You know, like, North Carolina, yeah. South Carolina, Alabama, yeah. Arkansas. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. So, so I know there's talk about Nashville, right? Yes. Um, any other place? So Mexico City, Nashville. Um, I, I I really want Mexico City. Yeah. Because I I like the idea. Every time I I hear of Mexico City, the first thing I think of is it's the only city I can name that's in an extinct that sits inside of an extinct volcano. Right. And I think there's nothing more like that's a thing you want. Right. You know, you have a team that's a mile high in the air. You have a team that's like super far below sea level. It might have the ocean like wash them away. You know, you have like (laughs) multiple teams in New York. You've got the Chicago Crosstown L train bullshit we got here. Right. Like. I want a volcano team. We got we got a desert team. Yep. Like I want this is like baseball superheroism to me. I, I want that kind of thing. And I think that Mark Mark Cuban should be allowed in. But to do it, you gotta like have a couple teams come in. Okay, then get a couple teams in. Yeah. Yeah, because you need at least two. You need to add two, right? You can't yes. just add one. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Two so four. uh so one of those maybe Mark Cuban could buy and make happen. I don't know. Like I don't what does it take? I don't know what it takes. It seems to take a lot to to found a new baseball team. Yes. Right. Yes. So and not just so a first. Lot you of need players. a city. You need a city willing to build you a stadium. Yep. Which typically also means you need a city willing to cheat its public. Yes, and the public saying, "Yay!" <laughs> right. We need. Here's what we need, America. Here's city, dear city you live in. Here's what we need. We need a baseball team now to get this baseball team it's going to cost a lot of money but luckily we have a very rich guy coming to own the team right he's coming on the team he's super rich he's going to put a team here we're going to love you're going to love going to baseball games here we're going to put this stadium not even in the city we're going to put it out in the middle of nowhere don't even worry about that you guys it won't even be a traffic nightmare it's going to be fine we're going to build new roads to get there did i mention a rich guy's coming he's got billions with bees bees big old bees got bees coming what's it going to cost i don't know probably like Seven seven seventy five million dollars, three hundred seventy five million dollars, eight hundred seventy five million dollars to build this stadium. That's a lot of millions, I know, but we can get this done because I mentioned this guy's a billionaire. Yeah. So here's what we're gonna do: we're gonna raise your taxes, all right? We're gonna have a special tax initiative. We're gonna have a special tax balloting. We're gonna have a special assessment. Gas is gonna cost a little bit more. Candy bars are gonna cost a little bit more. Your porn's gonna cost a little bit more. Like everything's gonna cost a little bit more for you. But man, this billionaire is gonna come here and put a baseball team in. Yes, I know it sounds like you're having to pay for this thing. I know it sounds that way, but if you would just come a little bit more to our side of the thing, you will understand that we need you to pay for it to attract the billionaire here because he has all the billions, right? Because he's going to put a baseball team here and you're going to love having a baseball team. Here. But right. first, we got to build this stadium, which means we need you, you to deep into your pockets, American City guy, yeah. to help this happen. That's yep. what happens. Yep. The, the, yep. the cities and the paying all this damn money to attract the billionaire. Yep. Because if they don't do it, the billionaire won't come. Right. I told you, right. baseball's a scam. A yeah, billionaire doesn't have to come. Billionaire can do whatever billionaire wants to do. Yes. Yeah, pretty much. So um, I forget who, I forget the name of the guy who bought the New York Mets. Isn't that bad? Guy who bought New York Mets. Yes. 
versus uh, yes. um, uh, A-Rod and J-Lo. Yes. So who wouldn't have been really cool if Alex Rodriguez and Jennifer Lopez had bought the Mets? I think, yes, that would <laughs> have been very cool. Happen. <laughs> I think that would have been very cool, but yeah. that's back to the Jay-Z problem, right? Yep. You know what the owners don't want? The owners don't want former employees ever getting to their level. True, yeah. <clears throat> Are the who's the youngest owner? I wonder. I, I now I'm just like, but I'm just wondering about this now. I'm running away with myself. But you yeah, know, the, know, the average age of the owners versus it just seems to me that A Rod and J Lo would be like average age of baseball weight. ownership has got to be upwards of seventy, right? Yeah, and here's these young people coming along. So that is the ultimate kind of an yeah. upstart. They don't want that. They, right. They, they, that, want they that. would they would sell to to a group of used car dealers. In a consortium of like laundromat owners, they will sell to those guys before they sell to any player who played that game, who, who took their money. Yeah, You're not going to take our money and then take a franchise from us and then have a seat at the table. No way, we can't have that. Oh, that is too bad. I, I think it would have just been revolutionary. I yeah. agree. All the right like, way. It's it's they would rather have the fight with Jay Z over over representation. Yeah, than to like find that a rod. Yeah. Who will then come in with a group of other former players who saved their money? Yeah, you know, well, who like have a Derek beef Jeter. with some of these owners. Derek Jeter's like little group down there in Miami, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I just thought of that. I don't know though. A Rod and J Lo, they just have a charisma about them. Like Derek Jeter isn't what I would call charismatic, and uh, so he he'll just sit in the shades and look like he's very behind the scenes. Whereas you couldn't have had A Rod and J Lo showing up anywhere without you know a zillion cameras going off constantly, and they would just be shining like you know with the shining light, and it just would have been so cool, and it would have been so New York, and it just I would have loved it, and you know there's clearly um, a real passion for baseball there with Alex Rodriguez. I mean such a passion. Um, not saying that Jeter isn't passionate, but I just, I just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I would have loved it. I would have thought it would have just been the coolest thing ever from an entertainment perspective, but also maybe from the Mets becoming a really, really good team perspective. Sure. You know, and, uh, and I can see why the owners would not want that happening. Uh, you know, Jay-Z comes along, he founds a sports representation company and you got to deal with him, but he's going to go away. You know, like you're going to get everything signed and then the season like, starts. You guys get some owners won't ever have to deal with him because it'll yeah. just be like, we don't want to deal with any of his players, right? Yeah. People choose not to deal with any Scott Boris talent. Yeah. Yeah. You know? But even if, yeah, I mean, just, you know, but, but uh, A Rod and J Lo, they're going to be there for good. 365. Yep. You know, for good. And, uh, and, and I can see why. Uh, well, I mean, if I were in charge, they would own the Mets right now. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, man, one last thing, because uh, we still have a little time, I think, yep. um, is uh, what's what do you think the Marlins are going to do? Or more to the point, what do you think the Marlins' new GM is going to do? So the first thing to do if you're the Marlins is to not break the bank, rewarding guys for the COVID season. Right. Step one, don't break the bank. Right. right. Like you, you put on a good showing for yourself. Right. right. But if you got holes, be it in, in starting pitching or in relieving, you can fill those holes in without breaking your back. You can't go around and go, man, look at, did you see what we just did? Now we got to start doubling salaries because that's going to kill you. You need to keep those guys young and hungry. Yeah. You know, you need to like let them, make them understand that now what they just showed that they pulled off, you could do that over the course of a whole season. You can build something there. Yeah. The danger there is going to be if those guys, are as good as they were, like if that's real, th uh, some of them are gonna really come, they're gonna come up for new paper all around the same time, and then you're in trouble. Yeah. You know, you're in trouble. You 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 need depth if yeah, you're the you if you're the Marlins to be able to succeed. Yeah. You know, with your all of your 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 who are those guys players, right? Yeah. Like depth is what's gonna get you ahead because right. you're gonna lose some guys at some point and you didn't have next man up to keep pushing. Right, right. You know, you do but have you that. can fill in pitching and, and, and relieving and things like that if you need it, but it's not time to break the bank yet. No. You're not there. That's how that's how that first round of the playoffs um showed us that the Marlins have a lot of holes. Yeah. That was my key takeaway from the Marlins. It's not how good are these guys? Wow, this is amazing. Or look at that awesome. I still cannot name a player on the Marlins. <laughs> right. 
Right. <laughs> Which in a way is good. Team. In a way, because that shows that shows that they they brought guys up through their system who could play. Yeah. Right. And in their first real chance together, yeah. they made the playoffs, but we the playoffs were expanded. Yeah. And they beat somebody. They beat the Cubs. Yeah, they did. Right. So you you got through a round of the playoffs with these guys. Yep. Yeah. Right. Now you can't go and be like, all right, everybody gets a raise. Yeah. I don't think you can pull that, but you also can't like like you're not one player away yet right you know like you you might be right you might be trade depending on how that division goes Uh uh-huh you might be a trade deadline move yeah yeah that you can do but again you're you're if there's if that trade deadline move isn't going to get you the world series and you're really only doing it to pop your fan base right right you're really doing it to get those guys to be like we're going for it when you know you're not going for it how much good enough not you're going to win soon how much influence do you see, um, uh, you know, somebody like uh, Jeter, a former player, uh, who student of the game? How much influence do you see that having on on how the Marlins build and how they play? I think that it's a good thing having a guy like Jeter because it's credibility there. Yeah. Right. If, if Jeter's going to say this is how we out, this is how we do it. This is going to be our way. This huh? is going to be our blueprint. Then people are going to listen to him because he won. Yeah. Right. There's there's a lot of like beloved players in, in baseball. Who retire who didn't actually win a thing right like yeah it's harder for young guys to listen to those dudes you know they can these guys can they can look at Derek Jeter winning mm-hmm. recently even you know what I mean yeah and it's the longevity that he had yeah you know if you had a coaching staff that had like Chipper Jones Derek Jeter and King Griffey Jr. on it you know like you you could get <laughs> players to buy into a lot from those guys yeah that's right right because those guys did the thing that's if right. they were in, if those guys were in your front office you could really convince a lot of players to do a lot of different things. Right. Right. But if it's just guy, if it's just rich guys. Right. Or like, you know, journeyman GMs and shit. Right. And, and, and coaching staff, it's a little hard to sell. Right. Like if was, let's say Jim Leland or those kind of guys who've been around for like ever and ever and ever, who are now 90 years old. Right. Trying to like, you know, coach you up. It's like, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I know what he's saying, but I'm, I'm trying to flip this back. Yeah. You so know? maybe yeah. I, I want to be on sports center. <clears throat> Maybe that was uh maybe that explains why or shed some light. Let's just say shed some light on why it was such a bad experiment to have a, a former agent as a man as as a general manager, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. that's somebody who's I mean, even though we have already established that it is the good and proper thing for an agent to have nothing but his client's interest in mind. Right. It also means that you burn a lot of bridges, you make a lot of enemies, you cook up a bad reputation, people don't like you, and now you're trying to get a team in motion. I don't know, not a good idea. Right. I didn't, I was on the fence before that started, uh, but now in retrospect, it was like, yeah, that didn't work. <laughs> so, so, okay, one last topic. I haven't gone here yet. Um, uh, one last topic. I don't know if you have somebody like Tony LaRussa here at Baseball Reference. Oh God! <laughs> I had to hear what you have to say about this. Oh, man. I have to hear it. <laughs> These poor dudes. Oh man, <laughs> Tony fucking Larusa. <laughs> this is literally an example of what we're saying, which is like this: the 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 old boy network ownership group thing. Yeah. Doing exactly what the team doesn't want it to do. Right. Right. Doing what the fan base doesn't want. And what you know the players don't want. <laughs> and honestly, I think it comes out of like, I believe that that the owner of the White Sox knows Tony La Russa only has so much time left and wants to save this guy's reputation by getting him back into baseball. Yeah. So we remember Tony La Russa going out in the hide. But the next time Tony La Russa is fired, we won't be talking about the alcoholism, the, the drunk driving, the steroids, the... A uh, 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 bad take on social injustice just this year. Right. The drunk driving from this year. <laughs> like the idea was supposed to be that he would come here, manage this ready to win baseball team, and then we would remember that Tony Larusa going out on the high note. Except <laughs> the minute his name came up, yeah. <laughs> everyone and their mother said, "Nah, that ain't it, Chief." Not that guy. And I'll say this as also hearing the names A.J. Hinch, you know, and Alex Cora, these guys, like, I'm less concerned about 
the dudes involved in like the Astros and the Red Sox cheating scandals, right? I'm right. less concerned about that. I'm more concerned that when you need a manager who can communicate with players that are basically range in age from you know 19 to 26, right? Who are young upcoming all-star players. Yeah. All-star players and all-star caliber players, rookie of the year caliber players, they don't really need grandpa telling them how to play the game, right? right. They know how to play the game. Right. They need a strategy guy. Right. And they need they need guys who can who can keep them healthy. Right. Right. And guys who are going to keep their attitudes up and put them in the best position to win the game. Right. Don't tell me Tony LaRusso invented the bullpen. Nope. We got teams in this league who have one guy who starts a game for one inning and then somebody else comes and pitches innings two through six. Yeah. Fuck your bullpen knowledge. Yeah, exactly. No one cares. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. This is uh, I, I think that the, I think that what happened, I think, okay, and um, man, predicting the future is so hard, but I think that Tony La Russa was already not wanted by the fans. Players wouldn't say anything and good, good on them. We don't know what the players wanted, but we know the fans didn't want him. It got him you, know, you know why, you know what, why the players are so good about this thing? Well, so far, as, as far as we here in Chicago know, uh -huh. the players haven't talked to Tony La Russa yet. I thought Tim Anderson had. He hadn't called him. Oh, interesting. Well, Tony LaRue has reached out to nobody. I mean, unless you are in Chicago, are they are they going around bitching about that? The player, well, Chicago's bitching about it. The yeah. players are being very tactful. Yes, the players are tactful. And I, and I suspect credit. this because I'm I'm feeling like yeah. I don't know that Tony LaRue makes it to opening day. Although I will say for Cubans, they're probably not being tactful. It's just that nobody speaks Cuban style. Correct. Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> four Cubans are probably saying all kinds of shit. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And only the other Cubans know what they're saying. They're I, like, oh, I would oh, love God. to know what's on the group text of the four <laughs> Cuban bar players on this team. So yeah, maybe La Russa doesn't make it to opening day. Maybe that's, maybe that's the case. I, I just, uh, I just, uh, I forgot what I was going to speculate about, but, uh, but that there was something along those lines, definitely that Larissa was just going to be a figurehead um, manager and name only. Yeah. That would make him an, except um, he's, he's, you know. his ego won't let him be manager and name only. Yeah. He needs yeah. to manage. Right. So like, he could really do damage to the team. Because yes. he seems to me like the kind of guy that leads young people by saying, know your place. Yes. And they're like, well, my place is to be the biggest superstar on this stage, so fuck off. Yes. Right. You know, but then you can't do that. I'm going to go out there and hit these damn home runs is what I'm going to go do. Yeah, and I'm going to flip my bat in your direction every single right. time. I'm going to watch me hit this triple. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Love those guys. Love what you're yeah. talking about. I forget what I was going to guess, but I like your idea better. I like the idea of him not making it till opening day. You yeah, know, the, only, like the, the, thing that, the only thing that gives me a little worry is he's already hired a pitching coach who I uh -huh. think is a good guy. I think he hired a good guy's pitching coach. I forget who it is, but I remember when I was hearing about the guy, I was like, I think I like this dude. Okay. Right? So, like, Don Cooper was getting nowhere, but they weren't even listening to him anymore. Right. So he had to go. Right. He lost the pitching staff. This right. new guy is a, a former major leaguer who is a relatively young guy as well, who I think pitched with Max Freed and – um for some reason, I think he pitched with Max Fried and 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 um, Giolito and oh, good stuff. Like like I think he at some point was like a, a teammate of theirs back in the day, but now he's a coach. You know, so they, they ended up getting the young analytic pitcher, wow, pitching coach, to balance Tony Larusa's like inability to, you know, possibly manage anymore. That's definitely not Don Cooper. He's gone. Yeah. So Google search is not filling that in nicely. Let's see what it says. Ethan Katz. There we Ethan go. Ethan Katz. There yeah, well, he is a young guy. Yeah. Woo. Pitching coach for Lucas Giolito in high school. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's that is a great thing. Obviously, he has experience with the Giants, so yes. he's got maybe a little Dave Rigetti on him, and that would be a great thing. Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, a great thing. So, so there we have it. And uh, but why would he, why would he go if Tony Larusa goes? He he'd stay, don't you think? Yeah, usually when the manager goes, we got to fire everybody that, you know, worked for you. But in this case, I think this is more like I'm willing to bet that Tony La Russa didn't directly hire this guy, that the general manager hired this guy. OK. Right. The okay. owner picked Tony La Russa, the general manager's picking position coaches mm -hmm. because he knows what he's got. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I am willing to remember Tony La Russa 
as the guy who was around when my Cardinals won some really key World Series that I needed them to win because of what it did for my heart and my mental outlook at the time. Yeah. Did you have money I'm on the games too? Perfectly fine with uh, with remembering Tony La Russa for that, but I just want to remember him at this point. <laughs> you, you did not. You, are you saying you didn't have money on the games back then? No, I didn't have money. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have money at all. Uh, my, no money. I never had money, but I mean, I might just take my life on a couple of them. That's overstating it. But, you know, I remember this one time. I, I remember this era. I remember this era of your life. Yeah, you do. There, there was a there was a day, there was a season there. And I mean, like a season, like a couple of weeks when I was so down in the dumps. And I have these times, right, where I get like that low. And it was the, um, it was the, uh, oh gosh, I usually remember the guy's name, uh, but it, it was when they were playing in New York, they were playing the Mets. It was for the National League Championship. And, um, and you, you were, I remember this guy's name all the time. And right now I'm forgetting, but Scott Rowland is at the plate and he hits a home run and what's his name robs him. One of the best plays ever in the history of the game. You see on every highlight reel, you will put on, top 10 plays ever or top 10 world series plays ever that guy he robbed scott rowan and i don't i mean to me it was just like awful um because you know you, you just you kind of live through these yes. guys sometimes you know and you're thinking yeah that's what's happened to all of my home runs too and it's awful and life is awful and i don't know if i can go on you know and then the very next time scott rowan's at bat um he's unfazed Yes. And it hits a home run. And it's just like, and it's just, that kind of stuff picks you up. And, it's, just, and it just, tells you, you know, I can keep going. Go. I, yeah. I'm going to be Scott Rowan because that man, that man is strong. And I can be strong like that too. That's, that's the kind of stuff that baseball can do for me, you know, is, uh, is not, not go home uh, to, to maybe never get up again because I tried so hard, but even that happened, you know, even yes. that home run, that was a, freaking home run and that guy stole it and that's what life does to me all the time bam, bam, bam. instead scott Rowland comes back big and strong the very next time and just and he's like that time didn't happen this time is what's happening and, and he wins and you're like yeah that that picked me up out of a pretty bad time you, you, you painted a so, picture beth huh you painted a picture am i good so <laughs> i hope that's okay <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i think that people that can relate to that you know what yeah. i mean that's yeah. very relatable yeah, yeah, this, uh, that's one of the, I mean, sports in general is so fantastic for that. And for me, it's baseball. And I will, as a result, I will never forget Scott Rowland. Um, I, I actually still have a lot of love in my heart for the guy that robbed him. And I can't believe that right now, I can't remember his name. I thought I'd never forget it. But, you know, he was so happy. You better remember it as soon as we're done. When we're I mean, done, I you're going to be like, right? oh, yeah, wait, that's done. who it is. But he just, he just, it was so much joy. He did something so great for his team at that moment. And I, I couldn't help but admire the, the beauty with which he robbed the home run. But man, that was my home run that got robbed and it felt bad and then scott Rowland came back and uh i wrote scott Rowland a letter because <laughs> it just <laughs> it just meant so much to me and that's where i went tony la Russa in my life is to remember him as the guy who was managing the team where guys like scott Rowland did that and i'm not giving tony la Russa credit for that it's just that he was there he was a part of it that right, was awesome. absolutely you know but i just uh, that's where i want tony la Russa to be is in that memory the White Sox are doing so much for my well-being right now, and I just don't want somebody, anybody, to come in and mess it up. Yes. And I don't think that anybody can stop them being amazing. They just are. Nothing you can do about that. But don't bring negativity into it. Don't bring conflict into it. Don't bring letdown. He believes people can protest all they want as long as it's a sincere protest, you know good old arbiter of sincerity Tony La Russa there right and what does he mean it's not a sincere protest I mean since when it, I mean this isn't like a protest that suddenly came from nowhere I mean this is a protest that has been there like yes for what 450 years I forget Pretty much I mean it's right. so long that we've been doing it take a decade history. yeah the only thing that changed this summer the only thing that changed is that there were all these white people who said no. Yes. That's what changed. Because they had to watch something happening over and over and over right. and over again. I mean, they finally right. saw it, you know, and they finally saw it. And and also, these are young people. You got you to love young people because they're going to be like, fuck that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just no is what they're going to say. No, you don't do that. And so George Floyd, he dies right in front of our eyes. 
at the knee of a man who isn't even looking at him. Right. And uh, and finally, you know, it's this isn't this isn't something that just happened. This is something where where everybody finally showed up and said no. And you can blame that on a on a on a virus if you have to, but but to say that's insincere, I don't know. I'm starting to get like mad enough that I'm going to have trouble talking. Right. Can tell you me know, the but, <laughs> but this is the know, problem. This is the problem hiring that guy. I'm tired. Yeah. All right? this stuff was known before they hired him. Yeah. And oh. if I want to enjoy my white socks and this is what I have to think about and talk about, that's not fair to me. That's not fair to any of the fans. And you know, the white Sox fans aren't a bunch of old farts like Tony La Russa. That's not who their fans are. Right. You know, and not at all. Right. So, so yeah, it makes me mad, but still the larger point that La Russa and everybody needs to understand is that those people. The funny thing about the white Sox fan base is that some of them are. Yeah, right? sure. They're just not like the like the south side of Chicago is a very interesting place, you know what I mean? But the south suburbs in various places have the, those Tony La Russa like White Sox fans are out there. Yeah. You know, oh, I'm sure they are. Every team has its old farts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're <laughs> can't help it. And come no on. Bat flipping. Everybody's welcome. Old farts and everybody. The game. <laughs> but the the you know play it the right way. You no, know, we could say play it the right way. Yeah, you could yeah, yeah, MLB network. <laughs> <laughs> love you guys you old biddies <laughs> oh my goodness oh my goodness wasn't it tim anderson who got into all that trouble with the bat flip or was it uh was it tim and i forget now tim anderson it was tim anderson's bat flip that his his his, his epic bat flip his right? epic bat flip it was yes. totally epic it, and and it was it was so it was that thing where up until that point bat flips were all the latino guys doing bat flips right right and here just this black dude who's a batting champ comes up and practically throws his bat into the dugout <laughs> <laughs> that suddenly now it's not a latino guy thing this is a baseball player having fun thing yeah yeah so don't do that right don't do that do more having of fun. it now and we've been down this ground before, you know, with all the baseball players saying, this is my office. Yes, <laughs> yes, know? yes. Oh, fuck you. I have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. How, you're going to stand there trying to protect half the plate. I got to get you off my plate. Yeah. Eat for explicit people. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, but I think it was I think it was on the MLB Network. I think it was Tim Anderson's bet flip on the MLB Network where Mark DeRosa just went nuts. I mean, he just went nuts. And and to the point where he literally brought a soapbox to the set or somebody put it out there for sure, him sure. up on it and 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 scolded Tim Anderson for bat flipping. And he was like, really? And that, that wasn't this season. That was the season before. And so yes. I wrote about that for Baseball Perspectives. And what I do is I went and I did a bunch of research because that's what I do. I went and did a bunch of research into where, uh, you know, doing the right thing came from because uh, Mark, Mark DeRosa was pretending to be a Roman, right? And talking about virtue. So I went and looked that up and I read all about it. And it turned out that Roman men were so into virtues and they had various ones to find. And it was all the how you play the game stuff because they, as a social network, they were dependent on each other for um, all kinds of things, including finding people to take care of the children. Um, so if you fell out of favor with your social network, then uh, then you, you'd be SOL because you couldn't yeah. take care of your basic needs. And so, so that's what virtue was about. It wasn't about, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very fine person of fine character, according to how you tell me I'm going to be a fine person with fine character. We don't have, we don't live in a society like that. Right. We don't live in a society where our social networks decide what good moral character is. We, we do have social networks and they do things, but not that, right? right. So, haha, -ha, to Mark DeRosa, who I'm sure <laughs> has no idea that, uh, <laughs> that, I, that I picked on this, on this point that he made. And, and, uh, and I, don't, I don't care about that, but <laughs> old bitty, but. <laughs> Please, old bitties. Well, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that kind of stuff is fun and it inspires me. Please don't ruin it for me. All right, that's all I'm gonna say to the universe right. where Tony LaRusa is concerned. Right. Okay. Whom we are hoping doesn't make its opening day. Yes, whom we are hoping doesn't, but we're looking forward to seeing Mr. Ethan Katz. Right. Right? Absolutely. And there we are. Uh, shall I talk us out? Do it. <laughs> I always feel like once I get going, I talk too much. Nah, you're fine. You're perfectly fine. Okay, good. Well, 
Terry, my friend. And to all of our fans out there, and especially all those people in uh, in, in major league teams and front offices and worker bees who are hanging on. Um, all we can say is hang on. Uh, it's going to get better. And every day, turn into the love. Thank you. Thank you. Until next week. All right. The fan. Catch you later, Legion of Fan. Yeah.